Let me ask you a question this morning. Have you ever forgotten an appointment? I mean, you look at your watch or your calendar and think, oh, man, I was supposed to be somewhere right now. Or maybe, you know, maybe not that severe, but you forgot you're at home and you forgot where you laid your phone last, okay? And don't tell me that we're the only ones in Austin who say to each other, hey, would you call my phone so we could find it, you know? And we all forget something occasionally, but how do you forget an entire town? I don't know if you saw this. It was all over the news this week for a day or so. A man by the name of Jordan Lyles from San Diego, California, has just come out with a sort of a film documentary. He was in the Great Smoky Mountain National Forest in uh, May of 2013. He was off the beaten path. He had his camera. And going down a, uh, an overgrown path that used to be a road, he discovered a 100-year-old abandoned and completely forgotten town. There was an old hotel, several houses. Nobody had remembered this town. The National Forest Service didn't even have it on a map. It's kind of a mystery because it's almost like the whole town just up and moved at once and left everything just where it was. Nobody really knows the history of what happened there, but an entire town was just forgotten. I want to ask you this morning, If there's ever been anything in your life that you wish you could forget as easily as that town was forgotten, but somehow you just can't. The reality is there are things in our lives that we would like to forget. Things so terrible that we'd give anything to not see them when we close our eyes. Maybe it was for some people a divorce or the end of a relationship and all your friends tell you to get over it, but somehow... You can't. Maybe it was a childhood trauma, the abuse from an adult who should have protected you but instead robbed you of your innocence and so much more. Maybe it was the opposite. Maybe it was some pain you inflicted on somebody else and the scars you left in their life have permanently affected the way you live your life as a result. Maybe it was the sudden loss of a parent when you were a child and the emptiness that their absence leaves has never been properly filled in your life, even in adulthood. You know, there are a lot of different possible ways that you and I can experience pain and tragedy, setback, hardships that we wish that we could forget. And even though we feel those pains to this very moment, We can't seem to get over it. But I've got good news for you today. God knows what you've gone through. And God knows how to get you through what you've gone through. And today you can turn the page and you can live again. And this morning as we continue our series, Life Uncharted, I want us to look at the subject, Life Uncharted, getting past what you can't get over. Now, I want you to turn in your Bibles to Daniel chapter 1. Daniel, the first chapter, but we're going to be reading some, we're going to be reading some verses of scripture that describe places you can barely imagine, names you can hardly pronounce, and I don't blame you if you feel like we've dropped you into a geography lesson or a history lesson and you're not totally prepared for the pop quiz, so... If you're not real familiar with this story, don't worry. Uh, In fact, if you're not familiar with this story at all, it's okay. Uh, I'm going to be kind of linking the past to the present as best I can. But let me give you an overview about where we're going to be headed today. Let me just share with you kind of in a paragraph what this passage of Scripture is all about. This is the story of a young guy who is kidnapped at an early age, taken to a foreign country, and he is never able to, go, to come home. But in spite of that terrible tragedy, he rises in faith to become one of the great heroes of Jewish and Christian life. And so today I want us to look at how we can look at his life and learn some lessons 
about how to live our life when we face those things that are so difficult in life. So let's look at Daniel chapter 1. Daniel chapter 1, and like I said, bear with me, these first verse or two may make you feel like you've been lost without a compass, but stay close and I'll get you there. In the third year, the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. If you're like most people, only the word Jerusalem makes any sense in that sentence, but stay with me. And the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand with some of the vessels of the house of God, and he brought them to the land of Shinar, which is the land of Babylon, to the house of his God, and placed the vessels in the treasury of his God. Then the king commanded Ashpenaz, one of the, uh, one of the attendants in Babylon, his chief eunuch, to bring some of the people of Israel, both of the royal family and of the nobility, youths without blemish, of good appearance, and skillful in all wisdom, endowed with knowledge, understanding learning, that is the capacity to learn, and competent to stand in the king's palace and to teach them the literature and language of the Chaldeans, that is the Babylonians. And the king assigned them a daily portion of the food that the king ate. Now that sounds good on the surface, but it actually creates the dilemma that is going to have to be overcome. And of the wine that he drank. And there were, they were, that is these young guys, were to be educated for three years. And at the end of that time, they were to stand before the king. Among these, now you'll recognize these names, were Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, which you also know them as Daniel, uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And they were all of the tribe of Judah. And the chief of the eunuchs gave them the names Daniel, he called Belteshazzar, Hananiah, he called Shadrach, Mishael, he called Meshach, and Azariah, he called Abednego. But Daniel resolved not to defile himself with the king's food or with the wine that he drank. Therefore, he asked the chief of the eunuchs to allow him not to defile himself. Everybody here probably remembers the drama that unfolded at the beginning of the 21st century out in Utah with a pretty young girl by the name of Elizabeth Smart. She was 14 years old from a secure, wealthy, loving family, and one night in June 2002, she was kidnapped from her bed and held prisoner for nine months. You probably remember the story. The, 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 the man who kidnapped her was a sexual predator, and along with his common-law wife, this heartless, cruel woman that he lived with, they imagined themselves as kind of modern-day prophets above the law of man and of God. While they kept Elizabeth smart, they... He raped her three to four times daily, chained her to a tree, and threatened her every day that if she tried to escape, he would go back and kill every member of her family, starting with her little sister, reminding her just how easy it was to get to her and insisting that he could get to every member of her family just as easily. You probably remember as the drama unfolded, most of us began to lose hope, even though the media kept reminding us about this little girl, it became painfully obvious that she was gone forever. And then miraculously, almost, she was rescued after nine months. A few years later, Elizabeth Smart gave an interview to Meredith Vieiro of Today Show on NBC News. We have a little bit of what she said right here. Elizabeth Smart said, and I quote, referring to her ordeal, there was a point that I stopped crying. It's not just because I didn't feel pain anymore, not because I didn't feel sorrow. It was just to keep going. I mean, it was just to survive, to live. Now, I want you to remember that story as you go back in time to 600 years before the birth of Jesus. There was another 14-year-old by the name of Daniel. We know that he was 14 years old. 15 at the most. 
when he was kidnapped from his home in Jerusalem, taken 900 miles, not 18 miles away from his home like Elizabeth Smart, but 900 miles away. And unlike Elizabeth Smart's happy ending, Daniel never returned to Jerusalem. He was permanently a prisoner of war for the rest of his life from the time that he was 14 until he died close to the age of 90. Daniel, you would have to agree, experienced a trauma so severe it could have ruined his entire life. Instead, he remained faithful to God. He rose to prominence in his career. He overcame numerous potential setbacks and became one of the heroes of both Jewish and Christian faith. And from his life and its terrible hardships, you and I can learn something about getting past what we can't get over. Here's what I want us to notice. You can resolve by faith to get past what you can't get over. In verse 8, when we read about all these terrible things that happened to Daniel, the Bible says, but Daniel resolved not to defile himself with the king's food or with the wine that he drank. Therefore, he asked the chief of the eunuchs to allow him not to defile himself. Lyndon Johnson once said, and I quote, yesterday is not ours to recover, but tomorrow is ours to win or lose. The Bible says of Daniel, Daniel resolved not to defile himself. Ladies and gentlemen, he had a terrible past behind him. But one of the things that you and I will have to accept when we, have, when we look back on those horrible moments in our life, those back-breaking disappointments, those heartbreaking losses, one of the things that we'll have to accept if we're going to get past what we can't get over is that nobody can change the past. Even God does not change the past. But you can resolve by faith to move past what you can't get over. The Bible says that Daniel resolved. That word resolve means to set a thing in place. It's as if I were to take my Bible and lay it upon this pulpit and there it rests, there it sits. I set it in place and it won't move until I move it. The word resolve means to set a thing in place. And in this case, he set his soul in place. He decided that there were some convictions that he could build the rest of his life upon. And although he was a prisoner standing on the, metaphorically speaking, shifting sands of Babylon, he had found a rock upon which he could build the rest of his life. And that rock was his faith in God. Now, you could say, well, did Daniel have something he couldn't get over? Well, Common sense would tell us that the emotional trauma that he experienced would be an emotional scar that he would live with the rest of his life. But rather than just imposing our common sense on the text, let's just look at what the Bible says plainly. In verse 21, if you would notice, the Bible says he remained there until the first year of King Cyrus. And you say, well, pastor, so far I still don't know what that means. We'll compare it to verse 1. Verse 1 introduces us to the fact that it all started in the year of King Jehoiakim and it all ended after the first year of King Cyrus. And you say, so far you're speaking ancient Ugaritic. I don't know what you're talking about. Well, since you don't have a Bible encyclopedia with you right now, let me tell you, I went ahead and read mine this week. What verse 21 tells us is this. Daniel was a prisoner of war for more than 70 years, and he died a prisoner of war in a foreign country. In other words, there was one factor he was never able to get over. Every single day of his life from the time he was, what, 10th grade, 14? Every day of his life, because of his ge geography, because of his location, because of his address, he was reminded every single day that there was a past that he would never be able to get over because he would never be able to return home. 
And yet he became one of the most faithful men of God in Scripture in spite of those things which he couldn't get over. You see, here's the principle, ladies and gentlemen, that if you don't hear anything else I say, please hear this. Your faith can make all the difference when you're moving forward from a painful past. And, of course, the big question is how? <laughs> how? Well, there are a couple things here in this passage that I want you to notice real quickly. First of all, you've got to have a resolved faith of a, pa of a past that cannot change. A past that cannot change. Verses 1 through 7 describe for us the brutality of what occurred. Nebuchadnezzar was the king of Babylon. He was the most brutal force of nature on the planet. He was the most powerful world ruler of the superpowers of the day. He was the superman of the superpowers. He was brutal and he overwhelmed Jerusalem in 609 B.C., 609 years before the birth of Christ, and and when he did, it was his objective to take some of the young men of the nations that he overwhelmed and take them out of the nation that he overwhelmed and bring them back to his nation, put them in a training program and make them his own servants. So when you look at the past that Daniel had, he had a pretty rough past. He had a lot of things he had to think about. For instance, when he was 13 years old, verse 3, 14 years old, verse 3 says he was kidnapped. You say, well, the Bible doesn't say he was 14. That's true. But all ancient literature on the subject shows that the Babylonians and the Persians took 14-year-old boys and put them into a training program which lasted three years. When you compare that to the story of Daniel, it is very clear that he and his three buddies, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, better known as Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, were 14 15 max when they entered into King Nebuchadnezzar's service. Nebuchadnezzar was a brutal dictator who kidnapped this young man. And notice what the Bible says. They were young men from the royalty, verse 4, and the nobility. Now, one way to interpret that Hebrew phrase, the royalty and the nobility, is not to see it as two distinct groups, but rather to see it as an explanation like this, the nobility of the royalty. In other words, the cream of the crop, the top part of the class. In other words, it is altogether possible and probable that these four boys who are all from the house of Judah, all descendants of the house of David, listen, all of them were probably in line to be king of Judah. David, Daniel rather would have been king someday, more than likely, if he hadn't been kidnapped at age 14. If in the 10th grade he hadn't been stolen by these Middle Eastern terrorists and taken to a foreign country where he never escaped he'd have been king but that never happened he lost it all at an early age and he never recovered it rick warren once said we are products of our past but we don't have to be prisoners of it verse 4 also tells us that he was retrained into the literature and the language of the Babylonians. In other words, immediately they began to teach him a different language, encourage him not to speak the language that he had learned from his mother and his father and his friends, but to speak a different language altogether and to learn a new literature. This would have included the math, the science of the day, the philosophy of the day. The, the Babylonians were astrologers. They, they gave us the modern horoscope and the zodiac. They were superstitious. The, the Jews looked beyond the stars when they looked up at night, but the Babylonians were fixated on the stars. Even one of their gods, Aku, was the moon god. They believed that the stars controlled their destiny. The Jews didn't think like that. The Jews looked beyond the natural order. They did not believe that the natural order controlled their destiny. They believed the God of the universe controlled the natural order and that they were in the hands of God. But instead, they began to be retrained and brainwashed. They were introduced to an avalanche of, of, of pressure to adopt the Babylonian perspective. It was as if they were the Jason Bourne of the 6th century. Everything about their life in the past was erased. They were even given new names. That was a reorientation technique to rob the boys of their identity and their past allegiances and even to undermine their faith. And you say, well, how? Daniel was given the name Belteshazzar. Daniel means God is my judge. Belteshazzar means Bel, the God of, of Babylon, protect his life. 
Hananiah was given the name Shadrach. Hananiah means the Lord shows grace. Shadrach means command of Aku or under the command of Aku, the moon god. Mishael was given the name Meshach. Mishael means who is like God. It's like there's no God like Jehovah, you know. Mishael means who is like God, but Meshach means who is what Aku is. Azariah was changed to Abednego. Azariah means the Lord is my help. Abednego means servant of Nebo. Nebo or Nego was the, was the Babylonian god. Even Nebuchadnezzar had the name of his god, Nebo. In other words, think about it. All their lives up until this point, when someone called their name, hey, Daniel, they were reminded God is my judge. But from that point on, they began to call him Belteshazzar. Bel protect his life. His name actually became a prayer to a foreign god. And every day they were hearing a new language, reading new textbooks, being reminded every day that there was a new God that they were uh, that they were known by and then don't forget 70 years passed verse 21 assures us that they lived their entire life there don't you think that they could have lived their whole lives looking back wondering why and even potentially growing bitter about what had happened to them and maybe even losing their faith in God you could reason as I'm sure some would, if God would have been looking after me, none of this would have happened in the first place. You know, it's not unusual for people to second guess their circumstances by looking backwards and wondering why it all worked the way it did. I wonder if our searches on the internet would reveal anything about us. This week, I ran across some interesting information. In March of this year, a marketing consulting company used what they call exact match targeting to collect a monthly total of worldwide search queries of kind of unusual searches. Now, all I can say is I hope these things are not related, but, you know, I report you decide. 40,500 times a month. Now, did you hear what I said? 40,500 times a month, this phrase is entered into a search engine. Why did I get married? Now, I don't know about you, but e even if a married person has that thought cross their mind, Google can't answer that question for you. And yet annually, more than a half a million people worldwide sit down at a keyboard and enter the question, why did I get married? But now listen to how this goes. And as I said, I hope this doesn't all seem to fit together, but 40,500 searches a month, why did I get married? The next search is how to mend a broken heart, 14,800 searches. How to get away with murder, 1,900 searches. How to hide a dead body, 1,000 searches. Now, all I can say is I hope those things are not related. <laughs> Amen. But it does suggest, does it not, that there are an awful lot of people around the world second-guessing their own past and some of the choices they've made in life. Ladies and gentlemen, even God does not change the past. And if you're going to get spiritually and emotionally healthy and move past what you can't get over... One of the things that each of us is going to have to do is accept the things that are unable to be changed and by God's grace accept his future as it relates to those possible things that can change. Because even God will not change the past. But even though there are some issues in the past that cannot change, I want you to notice there are some principles that will not change. If you look at verse 8 again, you read what may be one of the most important verses of Scripture found in the entire book of Daniel. After all of this stuff comes Daniel's way, the new name, the 
reorientation of the past, the, the new uh, college curriculum that he had to experience, the fact that he was dislodged from everything that he'd ever known, the fact that his mother and dad are out of the picture and never heard from again, the fact that he was at a point in his life, I mean, think about it, at the age of 14, so impressionable. Let's be honest, he had to be scared to death. Wouldn't you be? What if your kids were kidnapped and taken to a foreign country and disconnected from all possibility of rescue? Don't you think they'd be scared to death? But verse 8 becomes one of the most important transition verses in the entire book of Daniel. But Daniel resolved. In other words, he drew a line in the Babylonian sand and said, this far and no farther. You want to give me a new name? Nothing I can do about it. Call me whatever you want to call me. I've probably been called worse. You want to put me in a new school? No problem. I've, I, I can handle it. Teach me whatever you want to teach me. Doesn't mean I have to accept it, but I'll learn it and I'll make an A. But when you tell me I have to eat food that is off the dietary chart of the Jews, and when you tell me I've got to drink from the king's table, that is a line I will not cross. Ladies and gentlemen, there are some things that you do not have to do, and as a believer, you must not do. And if you want to get past what you can't get over, you've got to find a firm place for your feet to stand and say, this far and no farther, by God's grace, here I stand. Now, what's going on here? What's really at stake? Well, Two things are going on. First of all, as you know, Jewish people for the last 4,000 years, including today, have dietary laws about kosher food. And uh, that's an elaborate system of protecting the food from certain types of, uh, from certain types of uh, food that's not allowed in their diet. And the, the Babylonians were notorious for eating pork and horse meat was one of, their, one of the king's delicacies. And no Jew was going to eat horse meat. But there's more to it than that. You see, Nebuchadnezzar was a religious man. Listen to his name, Nebuchadnezzar. It's the sound of his god, Nebo. Nebo Kadnezzar. And Nebuchadnezzar, before he received his food, all of his food and his wine would be ceremonially offered to his god, Nebo, before it was brought to him. So that one of his priests would carry his food and maybe a little bit of it was placed on an altar. Maybe some of the wine was poured on the altar. It was burned up and offered as a sacrifice to his god, Nebo, before it was brought to Nebuchadnezzar. You say, well, that sounds kind of strange. Well, it's almost the equivalent of you and me at Luby saying God is great. God is good. God, we thank you for this food. And Daniel realized that in order to eat that food, he would be symbolically participating in the worship of a false god because the, the food had already been offered to a false god in the form of a sacrifice. And to eat the food was a form of worship. And Daniel said, I can't and I won't. Henry Ward Beecher, the 19th century American preacher, once said, expedients are for the hour, but principles are for the ages. In other words, there are some things that I'll go along with. Some things I cannot change. He said, you want to teach me a bunch of weird things about astrology that I don't believe? Go ahead. I'll pass the class. I'll be at the top of the class when it's all said and done. You want to give me a name that sounds like the name of a foreign god? I'm 14 years old. I'm a prisoner of war. What can I do about it? But if you try to force me to disobey God and rebel against God at the most fundamental place of my convictions, the answer is a resounding no thank you. Now, here's the issue. You say, well, pastor, I don't know if you noticed or not, but we don't have a lot of diet restrictions. We pretty much eat what's on the menu. <laughs> True. But here's where the issue crosses paths with us in Austin in the 21st century. 
You and I are going to constantly have to decide, will we conform or will we stand on the principles of godly convictions? It will always be easier to conform and to compromise. It will always be easier when you consider all the circumstances. I mean, he risked disobeying the most most ruthless world leader of the time. He risked standing out while others conformed. And after all, which 14-year-old boy wants to be different than all of his peers? As a matter of fact, which adult wants to stand out from all of his peers? He may not have wanted to seem too religious because after all, he was in a foreign country. And on top of all that pressure, he was hungry. Because there's only so long you can violate the king's order to eat his food. And I don't know if you guys, let me talk to you guys for a minute. How many of you guys remember being 14? Were you ever full for long? No. And if you've ever raised a four, if you've ever raised a teenage son, you know that teenage boys are like sharks. They live to eat. They're never full for long. I remember one time when I was a teenager, I came walking out of the house with two sandwiches big enough. You couldn't even, I mean, they were gigantic. My dad said, what are you doing? I said, I just want to get something to eat. He said, we're going to be eating in 30 minutes. I said, I need something to hold me over. You see, this didn't happen late. This was instantaneously and right away, no matter how afraid he was, no matter how many other people were going in a different direction, Daniel decided that there were some things that he would not do. And ladies and gentlemen, it is always easier at the moment to compromise. It is always easier to find a way to conveniently bow out of the circumstances in order to not draw attention to ourselves. But we've got to remember that it is not our times. It is not the popularity of the moment. It is not the philosophical, you know, uh, uh, conclusions of our own generation that ultimately decide our fate, our future, our destiny. It is the law and the principles of God that determine what our future will be and not our friends. Let me give you one example. And, 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 you know, here's how far we've come as a culture. Had I mentioned this 15 years ago, nobody in this room would have found this statement controversial. But today, in this very room and over these airwaves, this will be a controversial statement. Last week, you went to bed one night and 19 states had homosexual marriage. You woke up the next day and 35 states had homosexual marriage. Listen, the cultural norms are changing so quickly and knocking at the door of the church and the Christian so fast that you and I are not able to keep up with the onslaught of cultural reorganization and you and I will have to decide now where do we stand on these issues and a hundred others that are coming our way that we will not be able to control. The question for all of us will be this, will I compromise or will I stand on convictions no matter what the cost? If I were to mention the name Abraham Lincoln, everybody here would unanimously agree that he was one of the greatest American presidents who ever lived, but it wasn't always the case that Everybody agreed with that. I mean, after all, he didn't die of old age. While he was president, the American pageant, which is the top AP history textbook in the United States, says that one of his most frequent critics overseas was the London Times, who fiercely and bitterly criticized the American president constantly. But three years after his assassination, the same London Times eulogized him as one of the finest men who ever lived, who refused to use his political power for personal advantage. The reason I bring all that up is very simple. You cannot live the life of a Christian with conviction without expecting to face critics. But in the end, if you do what God requires, you will be blessed even if the end is somewhere beyond this life. There are principles that will not change. Finally, there is a potential that can change. At the end of that three-year program, verse 17 says that Daniel and his three buddies, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, 
were introduced to the king, and after a lengthy examination, it was discovered that they were not only the top in their class, not only did they graduate at the top of the class, but the Bible says they were better than all of the magicians and the enchanters in the entire nation. Not only were they better than the rest of the seniors graduating that year with them, they were better than everybody who already held the job. God had blessed these young men because they took a stand and God showed them favor. Alexander McLaren, the British pastor, once said, and I quote, being in Christ, it is safe to forget the past and it is possible to be sure of the future. Now, it's easy to focus on the past. You couldn't blame Daniel if he'd have spent his entire life focusing on the past. But I can't think of too many Old Testament books that are more focused on the future. As a matter of fact, I don't know when the last time you read the last chapter of Daniel, but it's significantly different than the first chapter. In the first chapter, he's kidnapped and taken to a foreign country, and his past looks pretty ragged. But in the end of the chapter, he is given a vision of the ancient of days, he sees the return of Jesus Christ, an event that hasn't even happened yet. Ladies and gentlemen, he was a man who was chained to his past, but he chose instead to see the future that God had mapped out not only for him, but for all of us. There's a big difference between verse 3 where he was kidnapped and verse 20 in chapter 1 where he's seen as the best in the kingdom. Here's the simple principle. What you're dealing with today does not determine your future, but how you respond to it in Christ really will. Now, may I share something with you? When Jesus Christ went to the cross, he took your past with him. Your past was nailed to the cross and three days later, when Jesus rolled that stone away by his power and stood outside that tomb in Jerusalem, the past was buried and the future was brand new. Today, I want to ask you, are you ready to move past what you can't get over? Are you ready for a new future? And are you ready to accept God's brilliant new tomorrow? Instead of your old past, it's a matter of faith. It's a matter of saying, yes, Lord.